Before we get started, let's pray. Father in heaven, I mean, Father, sometimes we think of heaven as out there somewhere. And it is indeed out there, but it's also near. Jesus taught us the kingdom of heaven is in your midst. He also said the kingdom of God is within you. So, Lord God, uh, tonight, and, and probably I'm asking for the rest of our lives, my life included, that we would realize the awesome, life-giving, encouraging, sustaining, blessing presence of our God with us, moment by moment, day by day, whether we're on our knees in prayer or, Father, in the midst of great busyness, you're always present. You're always here. Uh, the problem is that we forget to remember that, that you're always present. And so, Father, I would say the goal of this little book is to encourage us never to give up on practicing your presence continually with us, moment by moment, day by day. And, uh, Father, that we will all receive the life of being with you that closely. Lord, um, what a wonderful thing it is to realize that not only is God present with us, but God is present within us. And Lord, that's, that's just amazing. Help us to acknowledge that and to live a life that glorifies that truth that God is with us and within us and that he loves us and he has a wonderful plan for our lives and that you, we can trust you absolutely, Father, every time and everything in every way, absolutely trust you, knowing that your love is for us and always for us and only for us, Father. We love you and we bless you and praise you. In Jesus' name, and everyone says, Amen. Amen. Well, I want to, just by way of reminder, one more time tonight, to remind us that, yes, our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the counsel of heaven, the will of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, spoke everything that was created into existence from nothing. Nothing. I don't know how that happened. God is a spirit, but there was no material universe in existence until Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, spoke it into existence. That's the awesome power and majesty of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This same God, the psalmist tells us, leads forth the stars and calls them by name. But he is so close and so intimately involved in our lives that a hair doesn't fall from our head apart from his notice. Now that's, that would be keeping somebody pretty busy. I'm, in my bathtub looks like a carpet after I take a shower in the morning. Don't picture that, but I'm telling you, the hair is falling quicker than I can keep it. But I know that God knows it. And that just, you know, that comforts me. It's not, I hate the loss, but I love the fact that God notices He's so close to me that he notices. Not just that, but when I cry, he notices. Not only does he notice, but scripture tells us that he has our tears in a bottle there in heaven. I don't know how he does that. I just know that he does by faith, and it blesses me. So here's the God that created the universe. And sometimes I, because he calls him by name, I picture him kind of like backstroking through the universe and all these stars and everything are just being brought along with him in every direction, and he's calling them by name. I picture him that way, but I also picture him in this intimate, close, in me relationship that just blesses me. So my encouragement for all of us is never to lose sight, never get this picture that he's out there somewhere, and maybe we'll be able to reach him but actually he is as close to us as our own skin, even closer than our own skin. And the very fact that Jesus came, because see, look, Adam and Eve walked with God in the kind of fellowship that we're talking about here. In the cool of the evening, they walked with God. Now, God always wanted to be close and intimate with us, but, the, but sin separated us from God. Jesus came, 
the second Adam, to restore our relationship with God so that we could walk with God as closely as Adam and Eve did in the garden. Actually, I believe, even closer. Because God was there. But I don't believe God was within them. He was with them, but not within them. And so we have some oh, this in an incredible uh, possibility of experience for us if we will just dig in and be tenacious and go for it. Now, one of the words in one of his letters was, um, um, trying to think now, uh, it's what uh, Daniel said when they told him they offered the king's food. And it says that Aunt Daniel purposed in his heart not to eat the king's food. We have the opportunity to purpose in our heart to keep God and the sense of God who is always present with us, to know that he's present, to enjoy his presence, to worship him within and without, to worship him with our hands, what we do. And, and like Brother Lawrence said, he loves God so much that he doesn't want to think anything, desire anything, say anything, or do anything that might offend him. He loves God that much. And so that is probably all our heart too. We just don't want to do that. So Brother Lawrence got started by first saying, uh, realizing just how great God is. He looked and he saw the universe. He saw a, a fruit tree that was st stripped of its leaves and barren looking, but the eye of faith saw what God was going to do with that tree when the spring came. He could see the leaves come, the flowers come, the fruit come, and he realized how immense and awesome and wonderful is the province of God, and it just it did something that changed him very, very, very much. So he has these simple principles. I don't know if any of you, did any of you come up with some like we thought we would do? You did, Helen? Share some that were important to you. Um, the one that's important, that really, that at least um, I thought was that um, the motives for what we do, like he said, it doesn't depend on changing. I feel like I'm talking to me. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't depend on changing what we do. It depends on changing why we do it. Oh, amen. Um, so, like, those common things we do things for is for, our, for us. You know, we do things because that's what we decided to do. Or we decided we, we do it because some, we were hoping to please somebody else or somebody else has told us to do it. But um, on page 24 says that um, the most excellent method he had found, Brother Lawrence found, for going to God was that of doing our common business without any view of pleasing men, but purely for the love of God. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's that's helpful. Um, sometimes even, and I've been walking with the Lord a long time now, but sometimes I don't trust my own motives. I I don't trust them. I don't. I've I've actually you know confessed to Pastor Paul that uh, I'm not sure that I've ever done anything unselfishly with regard to the Lord that there wasn't something inside of me that was hoping for a reward out there somewhere. Rather than the whole purpose of whatever it is that I'm doing just be happen because I love him. Just for him and him only. Whether he gives me anything or takes anything. Like Job, like Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away Blessed be the name of the Lord. What an attitude. That was his attitude too. Whatever God did, whether it was to bless, and he it seems like he often blessed him, or not to bless him. He just, he just did everything in his power that to worship God inwardly and outwardly by what he did and what he said, uh, for God, all for God's glory and all for God's blessing, simply because he loved God. I want to get to that place. I am determined to get to that place. But I understand that it has to happen like what Daniel said. You actually have to purpose in your heart that that's what you're going for. You're going for God. God is the gold, and you're not for this, settling for the silver or the bronze. 
You're going for God. And so that, that's what I see. Uh, anybody else want to share something that was an important principle to them? Rich. Amen, Rich. Amen. 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 So he, he has taken those principles and actually shows us how to live it. <laughs> he lives it in this little book. Everybody could see it. This was a remarkable person. And, uh, you know, it said that he could be in the busyness of his kitchen doing his job was washing the pots and pans but he had all kinds of other duties and in the midst of that with five or six other people calling out to him asking for different things from him he could he would never lose his sense of God's presence or the peace of God within him everybody could see it his face was a glow all the time and so and he said and at the end of the book I I have a little uh, Here's what he said, everybody can do this. Some can do it more, some can do it less. God knows. Everyone is, is capable of such familiar conversation with God. Some more, some less, God knows. Okay, but the, but the idea of it is whether you're capable of a lot of it or a very little of it, God knows and God accepts it. Whether it's a great amount or a small amount, just the fact, even he said in this book, just the fact that you actually turn your heart towards him and tell him you love him is a an, an great act of worship to God from us. Something as simple as, I love you or I thank you. Or, Lord, thank you for the beautiful rose that I see. Thank you for its fragrance. Um, thank you that even in the midst of all that you're doing, you want to be with me and hear what I have to say and help me do what I have to do in serving you. So he had this ongoing conversation like I've been having lately. And uh, as I shared in church on Sunday, I can't even begin to tell you the change that's happening with me since I started doing this. It's like I opened up, like a, fl like a flower opening up. I'm a quiet man, normally. Ask anybody that's known me for a long time. You have to pry conversation out of me normally. Just quiet. But I'm content with my thoughts. Do you know what I mean? Some people have to be quiet so that other people can talk, right? If everybody's talking, you know, you're not getting very far. So I'm normally a quiet man, but now I find myself comfortable with strangers, talking to them about anything and everything with great ease. Something's happened. Just this, the practice that we've done since we started this little book together has made a profound change in me. If it'll do it in me, it'll do it in you. It's just a matter of doing it. It's like we always talk about prayer. It's easy to talk about. should be easy to do. But prayer is one of the hardest fought things that we do as Christians, isn't it? A lot of things try to steal prayer from us. And it's hard to stay faithful to it, you know? You just say, ah, you know, I'm tired. I got up at, woke up at 3. The Lord wouldn't let me go back to sleep. But the psalmist said, he held my eyes open. You know what I mean? And I, I can picture that. I got up. I read the scriptures two hours to go through my prayer journal usually it's an hour it was two hours this morning it was a different kind of day 
but he was in it. He brought me to it, you know, and so what a blessing. So, but I don't always do that. Sometimes I just say, oh, Lord, be with the church today. They need your help. There's, a, there's many sick. There's some that are struggling with the, with the scriptures. They're struggling with their lives. They're struggling with work. Oh, God, help them, okay? So um, anybody else want to share one or two? Okay, it's okay. All right. Here's some things that I wrote down that you all have on page one. We should live our lives solely for the love of God, always to continue to act purely for the love of God, we should, and we should desire until death to have done all that is within us to love him. Now, I can't say that so far, but I want to be able to say it. I want to be able to say that I've loved the Lord my God with all my heart and soul and mind and strength every day. That I've loved my neighbor as myself. That I've loved my wife Judy as Christ loves the church. I want to be able to say that. And he just gives these little, he gives these little, here's how you do it. That we can form a habit of conversing with God continually by referring all that we do to him. So today I was saying, Lord, I'm going to be up in front of the church today talking about this little book, and I ask you to go before me. I ask that you give me confidence. I ask that you put your words in me. I ask for your peace. I ask for your enabling power. I can't do it apart from you. And so I'm asking for your help. And here I am, standing in front of you, hopefully encouraging you. It says here we must first apply ourselves to him with some diligence. He wants to see what our heart is. Are we just playing at church or do we mean it? Do we mean it? Are we serious about really getting to know him, really getting to converse with him, really getting to, to the point where we trust him absolutely with everything, that we surrender everything we are, hope to be and will be to him and trust the outcome to him. So we have to do that with diligence. You can't just say, well, I tried to practice the presence of God today and it didn't work, so that, blah, that's it. I'm not going to do it again. What a waste of life the time that was. No, you, you have to actually do it. And then Brother Lawrence said that he did this. This is what he went through. And he said one day there was this inward unction that came out of him that brought it all alive through him. Everything, he could understand what it meant, and he just started to do it. Well, just, it happened. It was something. It wasn't something he did. God initiated it in him, and the change came. The change he was searching for. But the point is, he didn't quit. He was diligent to stay in that practice, wanting desperately God's presence, to know it and to know it within him. So you got to be diligent. We, we live in a culture that everything is easy. You don't have cash, you pull out your plastic and throw it down, right? If, if we don't get what we want right away, we just say, ah, phew, forget it. You know, phew, phew, you know, who cares? You know, phew, I don't care. I don't want it. So we have this attitude. But in this, I mean, we're talking about seeking out the presence of who, the one that's here always, but recognizing that he's here so we can enjoy his presence enjoy his love, enjoy his grace, enjoy his assistance, enjoy his help, enjoy his mercies, everything that he is, we can enjoy that with him right now, no matter what it is that we're doing. And, and so, you know, so you got to stick with it. If you want it, you got to stick with it. When I was in high school, I ran cross country. I was the third fastest guy on our team. But I didn't run with the fourth and fifth fastest guys on the team so that I could always win. I ran with the first and second. If you want, you, so you're hearing what I'm saying with regard to what we're talking about here, you have to go for the gold. God is the gold. And the gold is to recognize the God who says I'm always present, who must be always present, that he's here, that he loves me, he wants to be with me, he wants to help me, and he wants me to be the best I can be for him in all things, all the time. Since we can do nothing without him, 
Jesus said, right, apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, la, 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 I can do this and that. Well, nothing that will have any eternal value, nothing that will remain forever. We can do all kinds of stuff apart from Jesus anytime we want to. But if we want to be fruitful for Jesus, then how can we do it apart from him? We, apart from me, we can do nothing without him. We can honestly address God by saying, I do this all the time. Lord, I cannot do this unless you enable me. It's not in me. If it is in me, I don't know how to draw it out. I can't do it unless you enable me. And so, enabling comes. And then we can find strength more sufficient. Always. Always. Um, if we do well, we thank him. We can honestly address God by saying, oops, wait a minute. If we do well, we thank him. If not, we confess our fault and say, I shall never do otherwise if you leave me to myself. I say that all the time. Lord, I will. how can I change apart from your enabling power and change? I will always continue to fail, to fall, to struggle unless you help me. See, if you leave me to myself, I'm always going to fall and fail. I, trust me. That's been my modus operandi. But God has always been there to pick me up, dust me off, and encourage me to keep on going. So here I am 75 years later. And then we, let's see, and then um, it is you, here's the, here's, I think, I love how he plainly simply talks to him. He says, it is you who must hinder my falling and mend what is amiss. How can I do it? I'm just a man. I can't change myself. I've tried to change myself. I've tried to be Clint Eastwood. I've tried to be John Wayne. I can't tell you how many tough guys and things like that. I wanted to be a tough guy. I tr There's no tough guy in me. My son's a tough guy, airborne ranger. Tough, 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 I'm telling you. But not me. I can't. I can't live out those guys, Steve McQueen. You know, I could. I can't live it out. <laughs> so it is you who must hinder my falling and mend what is amiss. But look at look at his understanding here. Having done so, we give ourselves no other thought about it. All we've already said. We don't have to say more. Apostle Paul went to him, right? Three times he asked to take that that uh, uh, debilitating thing that he had, probably his eyes, from him. And he said, Paul, my, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. So we just give no, give no other thought. When you go to God and say, would you forgive me of this sin? We're not supposed to keep digging it up the next five minutes later and five minutes later, five minutes later. There's no confidence or no faith in God or trust in God in that. He is the one that said, "If you confess, if if, uh, if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness." So we have to trust that with all of our hearts and our relationship with Him. The next one, we ought to act with God in the greatest simplicity. It doesn't have to be a dissertation when you go before Him. Sometimes the most profound prayer I've ever prayed is, "Jesus, help," and He helps. I don't have to go into this long, drawn-out thing of, Lord, here's what's happening, and this is this person's doing this, and this person's doing that, and it looks like the insurance isn't going to pay for this surgery, and you go down and down and long. Instead of just saying, Lord, I commit this problem to you. It's not my problem. It's your problem. I'm asking you to take care of it. Yeah, are you guys, am I talking, to, I'm preaching to the choir here, I hope. <laughs> uh so simply, Lord, like when I talk to him, Lord, I just love you. Lord, I really need you. I really want you. I want you. I desire you with every particle of my being. Lord, let me know your presence with me now. Let me realize you. He's right there all the time. Speaking to him frankly and plainly and imploring his, listen to this, imploring his assistance in our affairs just as they happen. That's another way to keep in constant conversation with him, isn't it? 
That's pretty sweet, isn't it? I mean, it's just sweet. And we may expect God to grant it every time. I'll have a project or I'll have some preparing some teaching or something. I sit down at the computer and I remember Proverbs 16.3 which says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Every single time it is so because it's his word. I expect it to be so. So I had to build these shelves in the garage over in the corner because we needed more space. I went over to Home Depot, was walking through the lumber aisle, and I saw picture after picture after picture after picture in my mind of how those shelves could be built. I'm not a carpenter. I'm just a duffer. I can do stuff. I have some skill, but I'm not a carpenter. I'm not like Tony Feitenheimer back there. But he showed me how to do it. And I, I'm in the garage and I'm putting this thing together and I said, oh my gosh, Lord, this is amazing. It's amazing. This is wonderful too. So that, I expect that every, no matter what it is that I'm doing, I ask for help, I commit it to him and he directs my thoughts every single time. He's faithful. So here's another one. We need not let our greatest business divert us from God. We may know our obligation to love God in all things. May we know our obligation to love God in all things and then endeavor to do so with all our ability. Paul, what was that thing that you taught Sunday? The, uh, the enemy of greatness is what? Good is the enemy of greatness. Good is the enemy of greatness. That's not all of our ability if we just do good. Greatness is all of our ability, going for the gold with everything that's in us. So, I was a pretty good athlete growing up, and uh, I could swim, I could run, I could bicycle, pretty good. So I'd get in these mini triathlons, um, and some of them were reverse triathlons. They were swim, bike, run, which is brutal brutal but some and some some of them were uh, um, the one down in San Diego put on by the seals was run bike swim that is really brutal because now all your muscles are burning they're on fire and now you dive into that chilly water for the last leg of the thing but the thing that I can tell you is I trained for it I did everything that I could to train for that event. I ran as much as I could, I bicycled as much as I could, and I swam as much as I could at the pool down there at Huntington Beach in the, in the building down there close to the high school. All my ability went into it. Whatever it is that God put in me, I put it out there in that, and I made it. My younger son, Matt, I love him with all my heart. But he didn't train. He said, I'm young, I can bike, I can run, I can swim. So <laughs> we're out there. It's, uh, it was down in San Diego Bay, uh, close to uh, Marineland down there. And, uh, and I, here comes this boat zipping by. <laughs> they had to rescue Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I just love him, but you know, I put everything I could into it. He just thought he had everything he needed, and he didn't, and he paid for it, you know, big time. So anyhow, just just a little picture of I think, yeah, you can you can be good at something, but if you want to be great, you're going to have to put everything that you have in it, every single thing, okay? Um. We need not be discouraged by our faults, that's our sins. We need only to confess them to God without making excuses. After doing so, we can peaceably return to our usual practice of love and adoration. I do that all the time. In the morning, I wake up and I say, Lord, don't let me have a prideful, judgmental, critical, or condemning spirit. I'm not out on Magnolia Boulevard for two blocks and every crazy driver, slow driver, you name it, they're out there, and I've got some 
condemnation. I've got some pride. I've got some. I've got the whole shooting match that I just on my knees ask God not to let be in me. So, but I just say, look at. I'm not going to change unless you change me. You heard my prayer. It's in earnest. Just give it over to you. Judy knows she's heard me. <laughs> what our wives know about us. Woo, boy. Boy, howdy. But anyhow, are you hearing what I'm saying? That you just, if you do fall, you just give it back to God and then go about loving him. He already knew we were going to fall before we ever did. Just go back to loving him. Practicing his presence. Worshiping, adoring, praising, giving all that you do to him. Um, by the light of faith we know God is present we know he's not out there he is out there he fills the universe but he also is close really close actually within and then content ourselves by directing all our actions to him, our desire being to do everything to please him. Second page. So I found all these things. If you actually dig from the, the, uh, the uh, four conversations and the 15 letters, all these things that I'm saying are actually in there. I've just kind of restated them for us. Here's one, we should be mindful of useless thoughts, that they spoil all, and that the mischief began there. We ought to reject them as soon as we perceive their impertinence and return to our communion with God. I don't know if you have that problem, but sometimes I'll have a thought that I cast out, and I bring every thought captive like you guys do to Jesus Christ. But I'll have a thought that I cast out, and two seconds later, the stinking thought comes back. And I have to take it to Jesus again. And then two seconds later, it comes back, and it comes back, and it comes back, and it comes back. But you know what? If we persist in doing what the Scripture says, bring every thought captive to Jesus Christ, then we're going to experience what Brother Lawrence is talking about here. Then they won't be so stinking troublesome. Do you, you know what I'm saying? Because we've taken it from being a troublesome thing, an unwanted thought, and brought it to the Lord Jesus, our Lord and Savior who loves us and died for us and lives to make intercession for us. So it will change us. And I like this, the next one. The shortest way for us to go straight is to go straight to God by a continual exercise of love and doing all things for his sake. So there doesn't have to be a long way around. You don't have to crawl on your knees for two miles. Do you know what I mean? You don't have to crawl on your knees upstairs anywhere. You don't have to crawl on your knees at, at any point for any reason. Just go straight to God. We don't have to do all those things. We don't have to do those exercises. We don't have to do those mortifications that many do to get to the presence of God. Just know he's here and go straight to him. I, I like what this guy is saying. And it's true. We don't have to do that. Um, without any anxiety, we should expect the pardon for our sins from the blood of Jesus Christ, only endeavoring to love him with all of our hearts. Thank you for your blood, Jesus. I love you. Enable me to love you more. God the Holy Spirit, help me to love Jesus. Our only fear should be not to offend God. Because that separates us from him, doesn't it? That the worst thing that could ever happen to us is to lose the sense of God's presence. Now that happened to me once at another church I was attending. I did something really bad. And for a whole year because God was telling me don't do it he put roadblocks don't do it I went around the roadblocks don't do this don't do that and I kept going and going and going until I lost the sense of his presence did God leave me no he was there 
But what happened was I lost the sense of his presence for a whole year. It was an absolute horror to me to have lost his presence like that. I, no wonder Jesus was sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane at the thought of going to the cross and realizing that he was going to be ex separated from God the Father, a thing that had never happened to him throughout all eternity for you know, a few moments on the cross. And at the very thought of those few moments made him sweat drops of blood to the point on the cross he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was a horror to him. It should be a horror to us too. That's the teaching to me of what goes on there. But I can tell you for a fact, you can, just like he said, you can lose the sense of the presence of God. And it is the most terrible thing for a Christian that you can possibly imagine. I had it happen once before in my relationship to Judy early on in a, in a start. And I did something really bad. I turned my back on her. And uh, we were supposed to go on a date and all this stuff. And it got all messed up. I didn't do it. And then she was calling. I got my roommate involved in the sin by, by uh, telling her that, you know, the guy, he's, I'm in the room with him. And he turns his back on me and says, I don't see him. So he got involved in my sin, you know. But I'm telling you, because I've always had a wonderful relationship with God, especially in prayer. I could, I just could reach him, could feel him, could touch him. I knew he was there and he was hearing me. But when after I did that, heaven became like brass. I'm telling you, I could feel my prayers ricocheting and coming down, not getting to God. And I said, oh my God, oh my God, what, what have I done? What have I done? What do I do? And uh, he gave me the scripture. He said, uh, bring your, before you bring your gift to the altar, be reconciled to your brother. So I had to, with shaky, we had still dialers in those days, not buttons. She, 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 she called Judy and uh, she did not want to have anything to do with me. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I started to dial and stopped, but finally I had to listen to the Spirit of God. And uh, I, you know, told her that I needed to talk with her. She didn't want to have anything to do with me. And I don't blame her. I'd hurt her terribly, embarrassed her in front of her parents and family on her birthday. It was bad. So uh, I said, well, look at, why don't we meet at Calvary Chapel? We were going to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa at the time. We'll go to church. So afterward, I asked her if we could talk. And so we went down to the Newport Wedge and uh, got out of the car and walked for miles. And it was one of those nights where the moon came up about 10,000 times bigger than it normally is. It was just, I don't know. I don't know if it was a super moon. I don't know what it was super to us. I'll never forget it. And we talked, and we talked, and we talked, and we talked. And uh, we reconciled our relationship through talking, going to church, and started dating and doing things together. But at the point that uh, I reconciled my relationship with Judy by telling her I was sorry and confessing that it was my sin and my fault, not hers, that my relationship to God just came right back full blown. First be reconciled to your brother, then bring your gift to the altar. Just remarkable stuff. So, wow. So here's, I guess here's what I want to say. I've, I'm, I haven't finished the second page of what we're doing. But what I want to say is this. What this book teaches is not just possible, it's probable. If we will just do what it says. If we will just persist in it. Now I know that it's easy to get busy and uh, and have all kinds of things happening around you that demand your attention and your actions. That can happen. And it does happen to all of us. But what Brother Lawrence is saying is find something. Now with him, it was just a tug from God from within. I, I'm here. 
I'm here for you. I'm here. And he just would turn his heart and just recognize God's presence all around him. But what I found out you can do, um, I had a watch in those days that you could set to chime um, at intervals. And I had it set to chime at 15 minutes. So in case I forgot my conversation with God, then when it chimed, I said, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Here I am. <laughs> I'm back. I'm seeking you now. And so, it, and so it would go on. And it really helped to prompt, to remind you that your goal is to seek the presence of God. Sometimes you can just get something round, like a clock or a wheel. Find something that you, when you see it, will remind you that you want to be and remain in God's presence. And it will be very, very helpful. I hope with all my heart for all of us that we will apply it, that we will live it, that we will breathe it, like uh, Brother Lawrence said. And uh, I think on the last page there's some interesting things that he said that really make a lot of sense to me. We may persevere in his holy presence with an, just a simple act. I'm telling you, I just say, Lord, I love you. Of praise, of adoration, or of desire, or with an act of resignation or thanksgiving. And in all the ways our souls can invent. And here's something that I think is really, really, really important. Would any of us in this room say that we know Abraham Lincoln because we read about Abraham Lincoln. No, you don't know Abraham, you know about Abraham Lincoln. What Brother Lawrence is saying is that God is there. And everybody can acknowledge that God is there. But, here's what he says, we must know before we can love. In order to know God, we must often think of him. And when we come to love him, we shall also think of him often, for our heart will be with our treasure. Do not forget him, but think of him. Adore him continually. Live and die with him. This is the glorious work of the Christian. In a word, it is our profession. If we do not know it, we must learn it. Let us seek him often by faith. He is within us. Seek him not elsewhere. Amen? So it's just as simple as that, you guys. I just want to encourage you um, to persevere in this. Pick up the little book. Read it often. Highlight it. Underline it. Write scriptures next to the principles that he's taught. Look at the scriptures, think about them, and realize that what he is saying here, he has put something together for the, for the normal everyday guy like me to understand, to apply, and to actually bask like he did in the presence of God. That's for all of us. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this little book that just simply teaches us how we might know you, how we might get to know you more, how we might recognize your presence continually and constant with us, because it always is. It's not that you've left, Father, it's that we forgot. And so, Lord, help us in our forgetting, help our memory, help us to approach you, to love you, and to, to bless you, Lord, and um, to serve you with all of our might. Uh, I just pray for all of these that, that they will do the same. It's our heart. We love you and bless you and praise you for all these things, Father, in Jesus' name.